Welcome to this virtual edition of the Dorothea Green Lecture Series, Crisis in Venezuela, from the geopolitical to the pandemic. I'm David Kramer, Senior Fellow in Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University. Well before the coronavirus pandemic hit the world, Venezuela was a country suffering and in turmoil. From the political crisis in the country and the economic hardship the population experiences every day, to the flows of refugees and the drop in the price of oil, Venezuela was already facing huge challenges. The pandemic is only going to make things worse. There have been recent developments in U.S. policy that seek to change the internal dynamics in the country. Russia, Cuba, and even China continue to play important roles on the outside. So what is the latest state of play? Where might things go from here? And what should we be doing to help ameliorate the suffering of the Venezuelan people, especially amid an emerging public health crisis while reckoning with the stubborn political situation? To address these and other questions, we have a terrific panel with us today. Cynthia Arnson is Director of the Latin American Program at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Brian Fonseca is Director of the Jack E. Gordon Institute for Public Policy here at Florida International University. And Frank Moore is Director of the Kimberly Green Latin American Caribbean Center, also part of the Stephen J. Green School at FIU. Uh, if I can, let me ask each of the panelists to kick us off with a few opening remarks. And Cindy, if you don't mind, let's, let's start with you. Great, David, thanks to you and to all my colleagues at FIU for this invitation uh, to participate in a, in a really important conversation today. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the threat that the coronavirus poses to the Venezuelan population, but also by extension to Venezuela's neighbors that have received almost 5 million Venezuelan migrants um, in the last five years. Um, I'm gonna focus predominantly on painting uh, a picture of what the public health system and the nutrition uh, status of Venezuelans are uh, today um, and the way that that puts them at, I think, at even greater jeopardy um, to this pandemic. Um, the Johns Hopkins University has a lot of credibility in the, in the global health arena. It has a global health survey that it has undertaken with um, two other organizations. And it gives Venezuela the worst score in Latin America and the Caribbean um, in terms of um, the, the, the functioning of the public health system. Um, and it also counts Venezuela as among the 20 worst health systems in the entire world. Just as a as a quick anecdote, to give you an idea, there was a survey by Venezuelan doctors last year that showed that 20% of hospitals had no running water. 70% um, of hospitals had running water maybe once or twice a week. Um, people in poor neighborhoods, and this is not unique to Venezuela, it's true all over the world, where poor people live in inadequate um, and crowded conditions um, in, in slums and other poor neighborhoods. They have no access to soap, uh, no um, a consistent access to running water to continually wash their hands. They're living um, close uh, within their own families and also with their neighbors. Um, so this notion of social distancing that has been a way to sort of flatten the curve, which is the the way we're describing this is just simply impossible. Um, last year, the World Food Program carried out a survey of the nutritional status of Venezuelans. The study was published in February of this year, and it revealed that only 8% of Venezuelans could be considered food secure. There were fully a third who were insecure and then some middle group um, that had access sometimes. Um, the crisis, the public health crisis for uh, Venezuela, and we don't really know the true number of coronavirus um, cases within the country because the testing capacity, of course, is extremely limited. Um, we presume the, the figure, I think, um, the most recent figure reported by Johns Hopkins was in the, in the around 200, um, uh, but that is certainly a gross under counting. Um, but this is a crisis for the rest of the region, most particularly for Colombia, but also Peru, Chile, and other countries that have been the principal recipients of Venezuelan migrants. Um, Colombia alone has a, the official estimate about 1.7 million, 1.8 million 
Venezuelans. Um, there's, uh, there's evidence over the last uh, week, 10 days, that Venezuelans are returning to the country rather than stay in Colombia um, in order to be with, one presumes, with family members in case they should become sick because the social safety net in Colombia is so frayed. And although the border is closed, the two governments are collaborating to allow certain numbers of Venezuelans to return to their country. But there are still, um, one presumes, many people who will continue to try to migrate to escape the breakdown and the collapse of Venezuela's health infrastructure and economy in general um, during this pandemic in search of um, in search of medical care and of, of basic uh, food. And although the official boarding border crossings are closed, that leaves hundreds if not thousands of informal border crossing points, the bulk of which are controlled by illegal armed actors, um, by the ELN, by FARC dissidents, by, or, by organized crime. Um, and so it's not only more dangerous for uh, the, the refugees, but um, I think uh, um, definitely uncontrolled and, and uncounted. Um, so this is, this is a threat in, in the same way that perhaps um, South Florida is uh, a crossing point, a, a, a door, a gateway um, from Latin America to the rest of the United States. Um, and there are ways in which if the neighborhood is still very sick, um, people in Florida are at risk, but it's also true um, of Venezuela's neighbors in the region and also um, in the Caribbean islands. Um, how does one get aid in? There are a number of UN agencies that already have, if you will, boots on the ground, uh, the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, PAHO, it's um, the acronym for its Western Hemisphere um, uh, affiliate, and there are, um, there are alliances that these international organizations have been able to make with Venezuelan NGOs. We should be very clear that a major obstacle to getting humanitarian aid into Venezuela is the Venezuelan government itself. Um, and this is one of the aspects, I think, of the current moment that I find um, the most troubling, that there had been efforts um, involving the Venezuelan opposition, but also pushed by um, dozens and dozens of Venezuelan civil society organizations to try to get the government and the opposition and civil society to work together in confronting the pandemic, something that would have been in everyone's interest. And the recent announcement of the U.S. indictments um, and the, uh, the um, $15 million reward for Maduro's capture, I think, put an end to a lot of those discussions, which is not to say that they may not be possible again at some point um, in the future. So I'll end there. I'll be happy to uh, join the discussion about the roles that are being played by Russia, by Cuba, by China, by India, by Turkey, the key allies of the regime that have helped it to remain in power at a time when its own economy has collapsed by two thirds and now is in absolute free fall with the collapse of the price of oil. Thanks very much. Cindy, thanks so much, uh, painting a rather gloomy picture, I must admit, but thanks very much for that. Um, Brian, let me turn it over to you next for some opening comments. Sure, I think Cindy's uh, absolutely uh, spot on. Uh, this is a very dire situation. Um, notwithstanding the drop in oil prices, um, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, you know, you're seeing a, an economic crisis that, you know, continues to spiral downward. And at some point we kept asking where the bottom was. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very tragic that the bottom continues to, to go lower and lower. Um, it's interesting, you know, as we turned uh, between 2019 and 2020, there seemed to be some, you know, confidence in the Maduro regime that it had weathered um, you know, much of the, you know, sort of the uh, U.S. policy of, of economic and, and diplomatic isolation globally. Um, you started to see the reemergence of, of, you know, street vendors uh, and some, you know, uh, economic activity picking up. Uh, Maduro, you know, sort of calling out and inviting investors to, to invest, you know, in the oil sector. Uh, and as soon as the pandemic began to you know, sort of make its way in the region uh, that dried up almost overnight. And so you're back in a position now where, you know, the economic crisis is, is uh, you know, 
um, is, is, is out of control and expected to get far worse. You know, Cindy touched on a few of the external actors that are playing, you know, really important roles in keeping the, you know, the regime going and, and notwithstanding, you know, three that, that jump out um, that, in my opinion, have some of the most, uh, you know, some of the most important roles uh, are Cuba, uh, Russia, and China. Uh, Cuba, and, and by the way, I want to commend uh, Cindy and, and her program at the Wilson Center. They, they have an excellent series that, uh, um, that looks at depth uh, at the relationship between Venezuela and some of the external actors to include Turkey, um, uh, Russia, uh, China, and, and Cuba. Um, but, uh, but no doubt those actors are, are playing an important role. So when we talk about Cuba, we're largely talking about uh, you know, a role in, in providing uh, you know, support largely on the security side, uh, building somewhat of a firewall around the regime, inducing a, you know, a sense of, of counterintelligence culture that is meant to coup proof, uh, you know, some of the, the, the institutions most likely or that would have, you know, the, the, the ability to, you know, to, to oust uh, Maduro and, and members of the inner circle. And so Cuba, while, you know, we don't know how big the Cuban presence in and is certainly speculated uh, to range, you know, uh, high numbers, low numbers, um, what we do know is they do play an important role in firewalling the regime from a security perspective. Um, you know, China is playing an important role, one, uh, I think, in, in sort of the international diplomatic sense, when the United States uh, came out to recognize Guaido um, uh, in 2019. Uh, Russia, Cuba, and many of the actors that you would have expected to, um, you know, to immediately come out and back Maduro uh, did. The one country that seemed to wait a little bit was China. China waited uh, nearly 24 hours before it came out and decided it was going to back Maduro. And, you know, I, I thought at the time that, you know, that was a really important gesture and, and Maduro, you know, uh, benefited from the fact that China came out and, and supported, uh, you know, his, you know, his regime, um, you know, because China has tremendous influence in that space and uh, has really worked hard to salvage some of its investment in the country. It's invested, you know, I've seen estimates as high as $65 billion invested, uh, you know, in Venezuela, nearly half of China's uh, investments in the region go to, to, to Venezuela. Um, and while Venezuela is struggling to pay that off, it seems that China may still have to continue investing if it expects uh, to get its return back uh, from Venezuela. And so there's strong economic ties certainly coming from China. Uh, on the Russia side, you know, Russia is the more interesting actor. Um, it seems to want to, you know, poke a finger in the eye of the United States, uh, you know, in, in, in induce uh, chaos where it can. There are economic incentives too. Russia owns a significant portion of oil uh, in the ground in Venezuela um, and uh, continues to assert itself in that space. There was some news uh, last week uh, of Rosneft uh, essentially selling its operations in Venezuela. Many speculated that, that meant Russia was pulling out, but in reality, essentially what Rosneft was doing was selling you know, its operations to the Russian government directly. And so now, you know, a wholly owned Russian government entity is in, in charge of its operations, which, you know, again, indicates that Russia is not yet ready to pull out of Venezuela. Um, it's just changing the way it does business, maybe uh, bypassing some of the important sanctions that the United States have, has placed uh, on, on Rosneft operating in Venezuela. And so those actors are, are really important. Um, but it's interesting to see how those actors evolve in the context of a global pandemic where China is struggling. Um, it's, it's attempting to, you know, to uh, um, embrace the fact that uh, many are charging it with, you know, with the uh, responsibility of the global pandemic. And at the same time, it's uh, mounted pretty significant information operations out there to brand itself, uh, you know, uh, in, in the current context. Russia is also, you know, certainly struggling, despite the fact that there are no numbers, lots of, uh, you know, casualties as a result of pneumonia, but not a whole lot of, of knowledge about what's coming in terms of the impact impact of the global pandemic. And so we'll see how those actors are able to continue to, to prop up and support Maduro as they're battling their own uh, in other parts of the world or in their own respective countries. Um, but uh, anyway, for the sake of, of not going long-winded, I'll entertain any questions, of course, you have, and uh, I'll stop there. Ryan, thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, Frank, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, so I want to spend my few minutes uh, sort of at least delving into a little bit of trying and explain the resiliency of the regime in the face of all these challenges that it faces. But I, I do want to start with something that uh, Cindy sort of laid out very well and sort of almost a plea, if you will. Um, I think that the United States and, and others need to make a concerted diplomatic effort 
to try to address the growing humanitarian crisis that Sydney's explained and that will only get worse with the coronavirus. Uh, I sort of, I commend the Trump administration for reaching out to Iran and North Korea and sort of even offering help in the face of this crisis, but it has not done so with Venezuela. And that's unfortunate. And I think there is an opportunity here, notwithstanding the challenges that the regime uh, will, will, will put up that Cindy explained, to do everything possible to work with partners, government and non-governmental to reach the, the, the Venezuelan people because ultimately to me, this is what this is about, it's about the Venezuelan people. So let me delve into the question of resiliency, right? So it, people often try to explain, how do you explain a regime that seems to be muddling through in the face of political, economic, social crisis, diplomatic isolation, economic sanctions, uh, humanitarian crisis, collapsing economy? That seems like a recipe for regime collapse and regime change, but it hasn't. We haven't seen it. And frankly, I'm not sure we're gonna see it in the near future. And so why is that the case? How do you explain regime survival or resilience? So let me address a couple of them that might be useful for our discussion. I think the, the first that, that one has to sort of understand is, and I don't have an answer to this particular question, and some of you have at, you know, sort of heard me address this, which is, what is the delta between what the regime receives from the its illicit and illicit economic activity and what it needs to survive, what, what it needs to muddle through, right? If that delta is narrow or short, there is more of a likelihood that the regime will to simply survive and muddle through. But if that gap begins to widen, and I think the crash in oil prices could be one of the reasons why I can widen the in trouble, right? The problem is that we don't know what, you know what those numbers are, right? And so it's hard to measure that. But I think that's one way, I think, of looking at it. For now, it seems that that delta has been relatively narrow and that the regime has been able to receive resources from all sorts of illicit activities as well as licit activities to simply sustain itself and use the tools of the state to uh, maintain itself in power. So that's one, one variable, I think, that we can address. The second, of course, which is the case of every, every authoritarian regime, is the use of repression, and sort of imminent repression, that the regime still controls and still is able to use against opposition and other dissident groups. It's using it pretty consistently nowadays. Um, the FIs and other entities are still very active and even much more aggressive than they've been before. So one should not undercut, underestimate the capacity, the course of capacity of the state, even though the area in which the state governs is sort of shrinking almost around karate's and in the interior, it really doesn't control much. It still is able to exercise certain levels of coercive power to stay in office. Third, uh, I think that uh, the opposition has presented a challenge, right? I think that, frankly, the opposition has not been up to the task. The perception, at least some of the evidence, and I think Cindy and Brian may know more about this, but the perception among the general public in Venezuela is that the opposition is not really an alternative, right? Uh, what kind of risk are you willing to take to confront the regime when you don't trust or you don't think that the opposition is up to the task, right? And so the infighting that we We've seen the mixed signals, the cleavages and fissures that exist within the opposition and that dictatorship is able to take advantage of, I think, weakens the ability to create the conditions of change from within. There continues to be um, an expectation uh, here in the United States and particularly in the community that we live in, that somehow the solution to the problem is externally based, right? That somehow the U.S. or the international community is going to come and create the conditions that will lead to the collapse of the regime or to regime change. That's just not going to happen. I don't know of any case in which the external factor or variable was a primary reason for change, right? It can play a supporting role, but it is ultimately a secondary role to processes within uh, or domestically within the system that will create change. And I do not see the from, the from the side of the opposition, all the commitment, the focus, the plan to achieve those ends, 
And although those cleavages exist within the regime, no doubt about it, I don't think those are being taken advantage of by the opposition as they, as they should be. So that's a, another variable. The next variable, and, and, uh, and Brian has written about this, so I won't go into much detail, is that one should also not underestimate the influence of the Cubans and external actors, but particularly, I think more than the Russians and the Chinese, frankly, the Cubans continue to play an important role. And I would be very specific and say that in the area of counterintelligence and sort of penetrating the Venezuela military to ensure that there are no uh, rebellions, coups, ex anything, any threat emanating from the military, I think there's a structure there that really mitigates or prevents or deters that um, from occurring. Uh, although you see it in other, in other entities within the state, I think it's most predominant within the, uh, the Venezuelan military. And finally, um, going back to a previous point, is an important, pro an important requirement for change is the deepening of fissures or cleavages within the elite, the, the, dictatorship, the, the elite within the dictatorship. That is to say that if there's elite defections, considerable or important elite defections, that will create potentially the, 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 the conditions for change. And we haven't seen that. Uh, throughout this crisis and throughout the distrust that, that exists with the elite of the dictatorship has remained united for the most part. That doesn't mean that they like each other, that they're, they're delighted to be working together, but there is this feeling of a sort of being threatened from outside. There's sort of a bunker mentality rally around the flag that there's much more to lose from change than it is from hanging together. That kind of mentality, I think, is contributing to elite unity to some extent. So that we're, others are not able to take advantage of existing cleavages and fissures that would lead to potentially a, a, one of contributing factors to, to change. So those are, David, four or five, I, I lost count of the sort of variables and factors that I think are making it hard to achieve change within Venezuela that explains the resiliency within the regime, it, despite sort of this dismal picture that Cindy and others have explained about the situation in Venezuela. Great, uh, Frank, thanks so much for that. Um, let me ask each of you a, a question dealing with, with the pandemic. And, and Cindy, the first is to you um, about the impact of the pandemic spreading inside and the spillover effects on other countries in the region. As you mentioned, some already are, are uh, overburdened with handling refugees. I imagine some of these countries like we have have closed their borders to try to block the spread. But what could the, the pandemic do growing inside Venezuela mean for other countries in the region? Brian, for you, if I could, and you can each touch on each of these questions, the, do we see a disinformation campaign from the Russians and the Chinese for a Venezuelan audience that this pandemic originated in the United States. We've seen obviously a broader effort by China to blame the United States, but is there a, a one targeted for Venezuela? And then Frank, for you, is there an opportunity for the United States through extending humanitarian assistance to Venezuela in this critical time of need to both expose the failings of the Maduro regime and possibly uh, tap into these fissures that you were talking about, that the current system is simply not working. Cindy, let's, st let's start with you. Sure. Well, I think, you know, the, um, the, the massive expansion of coronavirus in, in Venezuela constitutes in many ways a time bomb for the rest of the region. Um, given uh, the, the, the huge borders that really aren't policed all that well, I mean, I don't remember the exact number of kilometers um, in the the border between Venezuela and Colombia or between Venezuela uh, and Brazil. These are not easy areas to, uh, to transit. Um, ways that people can cross outside of, um, of um, official crossing points that are, of course, closed. Um, and as people become um, desperate to seek medical care or flee. I mean, as many, as many Venezuelans are returning to Colombia because sometimes they're the only one in their family uh, that has left and they want to be, you know, with their families um, in the face of this 
threat because they, anybody else is really going to help them. Um, there are still people who are going to try to get out because the conditions within the country continue to deteriorate. So I think that um, it's a really big problem and it has led to countries, Colombia and Venezuela, who are at odds all the time um, and, um, you know, could not differ more in their perspective about what needs to happen inside Venezuela or in the world in general, um, are actually talking um, about ways to facilitate this kind of uh, humanitarian work so that everybody uh, has a greater, de uh, greater degree of protection. Right. Yeah, so I, David, I think that's a, a fascinating question. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if I can talk specifically to the Venezuelan audience, but what I can say is there is no doubt that China and Russia are, are, are playing offense when it comes to disinformation in the region um, and in the world, serious, uh, certainly. Uh, we know that China has attempted to you know, sort of spin uh, a conspiracy theory that essentially asserts that the United States Army introduced the, the virus in Wuhan. And what's interesting about sort of the Chinese move here is it, it wasn't done in sort of a, you know, among shadowy non-state actors. Um, it was actually done by a member of the, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in, in China. So a, 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 a ministry representative came out and began to assert the, the role of the U.S. Army in introducing that, um, you know, the virus in, in Wuhan. And this is something that we haven't necessarily seen in Chinese information operations in the, in the past. They've largely been very, you know, sort of uh, pro-China, um, you know, playing in very ob objective misinformation space as opposed to flat out, you know, promoting of conspiracy theories, um, particularly at, at sort of a, you know, at the, in, a, in a global uh, uh, media landscape. But China is doing that now. Uh, so it shows some, some change in, in, in tradecraft. Um, and very public and open about it. And we're starting to see that propagate in Spanish media as well. Uh, same thing with Russia. Russia has been promoting some of the same narratives. It's also promoting a whole host of other narratives um, that sort of lend itself to, you know, sort of the origins of the crisis, as well as promoting, um, you know, uh, you know uh, criticizing the United States for its lack of response and, and propagating those types of narratives that really focus on the United States. And so in the information space, we're definitely seeing China and Russia play. And in Latin American media landscapes, we're seeing those messages, you know, uh, resonate or at least populate through RT or Sputnik and, and uh, you know, in, in China Daily. And so, um, again, I can't speak to specifically the Venezuelan audience, but, you know, in Spanish uh, media, it's certainly propagating disinformation. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, Frank. So, yeah, thank you, David. That's a question that you raised in terms of U.S. policy that I, I've been thinking about lately. And I think this coronavirus offers a kind of opportunity to re-engage in diplomacy. At the beginning of this process back in January of last year, it was really a, a strong diplomatic component to uh, engaging Venezuela. There was the sanctions piece, but the, there was also diplomacy working with the Lima Group, working through other mechanisms the, offered by the European and others to, to find a way out of, of the crisis. Uh, the United States gave up on diplomatic engagement. And I think the coronavirus offers an opportunity to re-engage with the focus, at least in the near term, as I said earlier, in trying to alleviate the humanitarian crisis, right? Working, yes, with the Venezuelan government, but the NGO community and others to try to bring assistance as quickly as possible to the people who are suffering the most in Venezuela. And you're right. Uh, I think the Venezuelan government uh, dictatorship will make it very difficult to get that assistance. But once again, it will show, not that we didn't know before, but it will show that the Venezuelan government is more interested in its spur than it is in trying to alleviate the humanitarian crisis. But in that effort, it is important that we start bringing in other partners as we did at the beginning of the process. And hopefully that diploma, diplomatic re-engagement will lead to other ways of trying to address the broader crisis in Venezuela, right? We need to go back to that. Listen, diplomacy is hard. Sometimes, as you may know, David, diplomacy is about taking two steps forward, one step, fo uh, one step forward, one two forward, one back, and it's a struggle, but it's necessary. And I don't think we did a good enough job of sort of insisting and re-engaging. We got frustrated 
because we weren't getting the results that we wanted. I just wanted to sort of emphasize the importance of re-engaging on the diplomatic side of things. The humanitarian crisis offers an opportunity very focused on bringing assistance to Venezuelan uh, who are suffering, not just in Venezuela, but by the way, outside of Venezuela um, as well. Um, and then hopefully we can leverage that engagement into addressing the larger issues in Venezuela. And my point was simply is that people will say, well, Frank, you're being naive, right? These people aren't serious about negotiation. I understand that. I, I realize that. But diplomacy is very difficult and it's challenging and it takes time, but it's necessary. You sort of have to go back to where we started back in January when there was a strong diplomatic component to our engagement in, in the crisis, where we worked with a number of partners. We need to get back to that. And I think the impatience of the Trump administration has led us to be to, to developing a policy that's largely sanctions based. Cindy, I think you wanted to jump in on this as well. If I can add for the three of you, but we'll start with you, Cindy. Um, we've seen a few developments from the U.S. side, including the indictment of Maduro and other uh, uh, officials in the government. Um, we have seen this, this new proposal from Elliot Abrams and others in the State Department, but we've also seen a call for a, a more uh, buildup of, of military force in the Caribbean region. If you could react to Frank's comments and then also touch on those. Try there. Here we go. Thanks for that. And, and thanks, uh, Frank, for your emphasis on diplomacy. I mean, I think ultimately that's where the solution um, is going to lie. But I think that we have to be careful to think about sort of the different components and tendencies within the U.S. government. I mean, we tend to talk about the Trump administration or the U.S. government as if it were one thing. And I think that, you know, the kind of plan put forward by Elliot Abrams is very reflective of the State Department's point of view. Um, the uh, rollout of the additional um, indictments um, and the offering of the reward for uh, the arrest of, Ma of Maduro, um, you know, the diplomats like to say, well, that was just the Justice Department moving ahead on its own um, on its own independent of these other political considerations, but I don't buy that for a minute. Um, and then, you know, as you just mentioned, there is this, you know, increased uh, military um, show of force, if you will, to combat narcotics, which have always been there, but now, um, you know, uh, Southcom and DOD are putting more resources into the area. And I think the message that that um, sends to Maduro and his inner circle, who are very uh, corrupt and unsavory characters, uh, along with Maduro himself, is that the U.S. is out for your head on a platter, and uh, therefore, uh, this is the time to hunker down. And, um, and, and once you have a regime that is uh, hell-bent on, on its own survival, um, it's a very difficult moment to get the kind of flexibility um, that would allow for a negotiation to take place. So I, um, I don't see it as likely in, uh, in, in the near term. Um, I thought that the State Department proposal was helpful in, in a certain sense in that for the first time it indicated what would have to happen for the United States to relax sanctions because up until now they had se seemed punitive and, and it was just to squeeze the regime and make them cry uncle. And um, that usually, of course, around the world is, is rarely the case. Um, so I, I just think that this is a very difficult moment in which um, the Trump administration itself is divided, um, in which it's also playing to a domestic audience, which you folks at FIU know better than, than anyone, you know, in terms of playing to an audience in South Florida in election year, um, and I am very skeptical that, that, uh, that the whole of government will come together um, around a diplomatic or negotiated settlement. Brian, why don't you jump in here and, and address, is there co coherence or incoherence in, in U.S. policy? No, I mean, I, th I think there's clear clearly an incoherence in U.S. policy right now. I mean, on one end, um, you know, the, the, the policy over the last few weeks seems schizophrenic at best, right? On one end, you... You, uh, you double down on indict on sort of uh, dealing indictments and, and, and bounties on you know, Maduro and, and several of members of the inner circle. And then the following week, you attempt to offer some form of exit ramp in order to transition the, the country back to some 
you know, some initiating form of democracy through elections. And I think that's, you know, again, I'm not sure about the, the, the messaging here and whether or not uh, those messages are, are incompatible. And, and, you know, some have speculated, uh, I, I speculated at one point that maybe the indictment was to ratchet up the pressure before offering an exit ramp uh, and then applying additional pressure by, you know, having um, <clears throat> U.S. naval assets deployed to the Caribbean. Um, and in fact, Frank and I talked about this the other night, the, you know, you don't deploy naval assets uh, like that overnight. It takes months and months of planning. And so, you know, this has been in the works for some time. Uh, maybe all of the timing converging around the global, you know, uh, a, a rapid decline in oil prices is all meant to, again, ratchet up maximum pressure on, on the administration or on the regime. And I think Cindy's absolutely right. I mean, you, you know, uh, without the conditions, without, um, you know, uh, you know, some exit ramp, um, then you're going to force the regime to dig in. And uh, as long as it has allies that continue to prop it up and, and help it sort of weather the storm, that's what its preferred option is going to be. Now, I know the framework initiated at some form of amnesty, um, but uh, if you read uh, the longer version uh, on State Department's website, it gets a little bit more murky as to what that amnesty actually implies. The amnesty is being left up to the Venezuelan people. Uh, to decide, but you still have the issues of, of these indictments against Maduro and Tariq Alassami and, and El Pollo and, and uh, Diosdado Cabello and others. And so now you run into the issue of, well, how do you, how do you offer an exit ramp or an off ramp to the regime um, that is acceptable, right? Because if not, it's now digging for survival. And I think that's where we're at. Um, if I can uh, seize another moment to just you know, talk about something else I, that, that others have hit on that I want to just kind of reinforce is, is the role of the Venezuelan military has been you know, vital uh, in, in ensuring this, you know, sort of uh, to add to Frank's uh, comments and, and reinforce them, you know, add to the survival of the regime. And so the military has been a really important player. And in fact, you didn't see, uh, I don't recall seeing a reward placed on Pedrino Lopez's head. Uh, unlike the others, and I wonder if, uh, you know, what messaging is there. Uh, but there's been this attempt, certainly by U.S. policy, to also message the, the military uh, specific and very directly, um, because it probably is the institution that holds the keys to both continuity and change. But there are some, I think, uh, you know, serious issues about sort of our expectation of the military changing uh, hands here. And that's, you know, a few things that I think are really important for, for, for our audience to consider. Um, you know, the, the military had been purged over, you know, a long period of time, particularly out of the 2002 episode that uh, took Chavez out of power briefly. Um, but uh, over the course of that tenure, there was a purging of the military to ensure alignment with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, sort of Chavez and, and now Maduro. Uh, and in addition to that, they engaged the military in, into illicit drug trafficking and essentially tying the survival of the regime to the survival of the military. Um, you know, and the Cartel de Souls is a perfect example of that. That's where, you know, sort of where, you know, the, the you know, counter drug efforts uh, seem to be, uh, you know, focused. But, uh, you know, another consideration that Frank hit on that I just wanted to reinforce was the issue concerning the opposition. So one of the things I think is really important in calculating the military's decision to stay uh, versus uh, affect change has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, senior military distrust the opposition. Uh, maybe as much, if not more, than they distrust the environment that they're in right now. Um, and so it's really important to reflect on that, that, you know, you're asking the military to change hands uh, for an opposition that they think is, is just as, as, uh, as dangerous for the country as the, you know, sort of the, uh, you know, the, the, the regime they're backing now. And so I, I think that's an important note uh, to just sort of reinforce some of the challenges of, of uh, you know, of, of change in Venezuela in the moment. Frank, let me let me come to you and, and ask you about a piece that Elliot Abrams published in the Wall Street Journal last week and laying out the democratic transition framework. And he, and he wrote, the U.S. doesn't support any particular political party in Venezuela. We support a return to democracy and believe that every party, including the regime's party, should be able to compete on a level playing field in free and fair elections. Does that mean that Maduro could even run and possibly win? Um. My understanding is that Maduro cannot run. Uh, at least that's what was indicated to us recently by folks who have been talking to us about the, the specifics of the plan. However, the PSUV, the, the ruling party, is able to present a candidate for president, an election. Now, 
Uh, no, if Maduro were to win, I, I don't think that he would win. I think my understanding is it's between 15 and 20 percent of the vote. Now, why is Alien Abrams sort of mentioning that? I, I suspect wants to send a clear message that the, the approach is not to exclude anyone. This is not like Iraq that we want to exclude the Ba'athists, right? So we want to include everyone so that everyone feels they have a stake in the future of the country, which you wouldn't be able to do if you sort of decide to ignore or exclude certain, certain groups. But just to end on a quick note, um, David, and this is on the issue that, that Cindy and Brian were saying, is that the problem with the United States is that we don't have a strategy. Right. This is a series of ad hoc piecemeal policies that sort of throw it out there and see if it sticks, what's the reaction, and then come back and always talking about maximum pressure. And, and I think it's largely driven by what Cindy said, which is an election in seven months. Every month, I suspect we're going to see another punitive approach or announcement that hopefully the administration uh, hopes that it can sound tough and can keep certain votes on its side here down in South Florida. Cindy, I, I think you wanted to jump in on, on the military and the role it's playing. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to add to what both Brian and Frank have said about the nature of the armed forces. Um, it's not just a security force, it's a key economic actor, um, both in the, um, the uh, so-called legal aspects of the economy it controls, mining, it controls the ports, it, it, um, it, you know, it controls the oil sector at this point. I mean, key aspects of, the, of whatever productive capacity uh, is left in Venezuela. And it's also an enormous player in these various illegal economies and uh, illegal access to rent. So it's not just a, um, uh, a, a question of, um, you know, who's going to be indicted and who's going to face a prison cell in the United States, it's, and, and, and therefore who can be offered an amnesty. It's how you can really appeal um, to people that have a strong economic stake um, in a preservation of the status quo. Um, and that is, I think, another part of the difficulty um, that the transition scenario in, in Venezuela presents. Brian, if I can turn to you, we're, we're talking about a country that it has the, the world's largest proven oil reserves, and yet it is facing a fuel shortage. Um, its exports are, are down. Can you talk a little bit about the, the energy problems that, that Venezuela is, is facing and what the causes of this crisis are? Yeah, I mean, um, so um, my opinion, uh, this centers largely around the mismanagement of, uh, of PDVSA and the operations surrounding, you know, the incredibly lucrative oil reserves that Venezuela has. Um, it was about 2001, 2002, where there was mass layoffs of PDVSA employees. Uh, you know, I've seen numbers as high as 25,000 uh, sort of purged from, from PDVSA as a, an attempt by Chavez really to take over the largest economic engine of the country. Uh, at some yeah, at, at points, uh, you know, amounting to nearly 96% of the Venezuelan, uh, you know, licit Venezuelan economy. And so it's been, uh, and it remains the, you know, the most prominent source. The problem is, is that, you know, they're no longer operating on $120, $150 barrel per day. You know, they're down in the 40s and I, I think, uh, you know, 30s. Um, and so, you know, that revenue has been drying up very rapidly. There is an inability of, of PDVSA to produce at capacity. Um, it went from roughly 3 million barrels uh, per day in 2013, you know, down to just over 600,000, well, which is the last number I recall as we rounded out 2019. Uh, I saw some, uh, you know, press reporting that maybe it was bouncing back up, but I haven't seen any evidence of that. And I'm not sure where it sits right now, but that's a drastic dip in terms of productive capacity. Uh, it's leveraging some of its resources now in exchange for debt that it needs to pay off, uh, moving, you know, uh, oil to, to Venezuela, not, not to mention the Chinese and the Russians and others have taken complete advantage of, you know, the, the situation that Pedavesa and, uh, you know, Venezuelan oil is in right now. And so it's certainly not in a good place. Um, and again, I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, again, mismanagement, uh, overt corruption. Um, even though, and as, as Cindy pointed out, the military plays an important role in PDVSA, right? So 
I believe it's still Cavedo that's the head of Pedavesa, which is a, you know, a general in the Venezuelan military. And so the military has been charged with it, but there's still lots of, uh, you know, reports of corruption, even among senior military in pillaging, you know, the rents that uh, the Venezuelan oil is providing. So it's certainly in, in, in shambles. And I, I don't expect it without, you know, massive investment, um, you know, in, in you know, rebuilding of, of sort of a, a merit-based, uh, you know, uh, energy workforce. I don't see it bouncing back anytime soon. There are, if I can stick with you, Brian, for just a minute, um, th there is an issue about uh, renewal of, of licenses for some U.S. oil companies coming for review. Um, it, would it be better for them to stay there or better to pull them out? Well, uh, you know, my, my opinion on that is, is uh, you know, maybe not popular, but, you know, I, I've always been concerned about, you know, uh, not allowing American enterprises uh, into Venezuela. I certainly understand why um, I get that. Um, but I also think that, you know, in sort of the new era of global competition, what we're doing is we're ceding space to, uh, and we have, especially in Venezuelan oil, we've ceded space to the Russians, the Chinese, and, and others. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it's incredibly advantageous to, you know, the long-term American interest to not have, you know, a form, uh, an instrument of, uh, you know, sort of a, a American, um, you know, power uh, abroad and engaged in, 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 in that, that space. Um, and so, yes, every few months, uh, you know, American companies, the few that are remaining have to go for exemptions to allow them to continue to operate. And even then, you know, they're operating at an incredibly low uh, capacity. And so, but this is what's enabled, I think, the Russians, uh, primarily the Russians and the Chinese, to increase their, you know, their equity in, in, in Venezuelan oil. Like I mentioned earlier, I believe it's, the, you know, the Russians own roughly uh, 80 to 90 billion barrels of, of oil in the ground, which is equivalent to U.S. reserves. They haven't done much to lift that oil uh, as of now, from what I know. Um, but nonetheless, they're taking huge equity, uh, you know, in Venezuela. You look at the investments that the Chinese have made, you know, billions in, in, in oil infrastructure uh, through, through uh, uh, Sinovenza and other joint ventures that do have, uh, you know, tremendous influence over Venezuelan oil now. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that American companies, or just not American companies, but, but certainly there's not been enough of a global footprint in Venezuelan oil. Um, and that includes, of course, uh, I think American enterprises as well. Frank, let me ask you to put on your old Pentagon hat, if I could, and uh, talk a little more about the decision to beef up the military presence in the region. So I think there's been a lot of conflating here, um, David. Uh, so as Brian indicated, these operations are planned months, if not year, before the actual uh, operation. Um, it is true that for a very long time, SOUTHCOM and the uh, area of operation has been wanting these kinds of assets for many years, and we've had not much success other than some air assets. And it's been a source of great frustration for some of Admiral Fowler's uh, predecessors, including those that I worked with while I was uh, at the Pentagon. Uh, this is a struggle and a fight in the Pentagon where you know you don't these are not new assets that come assets that come from somewhere else, and they come from the Persian Gulf, they come from the South China Sea, they come from North Asia and a number of other places, and Admiral Fowler's um, colleagues at other commands, I'm sure, are not happy that some of their assets that are elsewhere. Uh, while they're thinking about Iran and thinking about North Korea, they don't see the reason why we should be thinking about Venezuela and drugs certainly not um, using the, the, the air assets and the destroyers and everything that are now being deployed, right? So there's a lot of tension and infighting, I'm sure, about that. Now, what the administration has done is tried to sort of speed up the announcement of this deployment to make it seem that it's more about politics and about Venezuela and sort of insinuating that this was more about, you know, uh, part of a larger strategy to contain or to even undermine the, the, the regime in Caracas. The two things are very different, right? It has nothing to do with coronavirus, notwithstanding what the chairman of Joint Chiefs Staff said during that press conference in the White House. Uh, and most importantly, uh, it is likely that these assets will be in for about five or six weeks, right? These, these have a deployment and maintenance cycle. Usually, um, as I said earlier, they're being called upon from other theaters that I don't see these destroyers particularly 
and these uh, sensitive air acids being around for more than five or six weeks. And the question then is, what happens after five or six weeks? The bad guys, the, the, crim, the, the drug traffickers are already, I'm sure, adapting to the presence of these assets in the Caribbean. And so they're shifting and making all kinds of contingencies to make sure that they continue getting their product up north, for example, getting them probably into Panama as earlier than before so that they can do, go up the corridor in Central America to the U.S. border. So uh, one has to be careful not to overinterpret the, the presence of these military assets beyond what they are there for, which is an anti-drug operation. And we also are facing problems with the pandemic. They're not immune from it either. So these deployments could be affected by that. Um, we're, we're running out of time. Let me just ask each of you, uh, maybe starting with you, Cindy, if I could, for, for last thoughts, and, and then Brian and Frank. Um, thanks again for this opportunity. Um, it seems that part of the logic or a big part of the logic of, of U.S. policy up till now has been to sort of grab the regime by the throat and, and uh, pressure and pressure and add sanctions upon sanctions um, until it collapses of its own weight or is uh, induced to, um, to negotiate. And, and I think that what gets lost in that picture is what many policymakers might consider collateral damage, which is the well-being of, of Venezuelan citizens themselves. And that, you know, again, we should be clear that it's the Venezuelan government that bears the principal responsibility um, for the dire humanitarian, economic, and, and social conditions um, within the country. And then the real question then is how do we respond, especially now with the threat of the, of the coronavirus and uh, the, the, the disaster that that could wreak, not only for Venezuela's own population, but for other countries um, that surround Venezuela. So it, it's really, um, uh, we have up till now tried to um, use humanitarian aid uh, in many ways in a, in a political or a politicized way, um, trying to get the aid in from Colombia into Venezuela, with Juan Guaido and his forces, I have no problem with the with the Venezuelan opposition uh, delivering assistance. But the essence of humanitarian assistance is that it's neutral and it's not politicized. And I think that we need to be thinking very long and hard about how to ameliorate some of the um, humanitarian conditions um, within the country as uh, as we try to squeeze and squeeze. Um, uh, and, and put pressure on, on the government. Many thanks. Uh, Brian, over to you. Yeah, thanks again, uh, David, for hosting this. And I'm going to you know, echo what Cindy said briefly because I think she's absolutely right. We have to stay focused on the Venezuelan people. The crisis is likely to get you know, much, much worse, and this has to be about them first and foremost because there's going to be tremendous suffering uh, forthcoming, even more so than we've already seen uh, you know, in the past. The, the other thing I, I think I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is, is that change has to start with the Venezuelan people. This has to be something that the Venezuelans do. And I was, you know, in just sort of echoing something that Frank said, uh, reinforcing it, I was very concerned about the timing of uh, naval operations because I was concerned about um, managing expectations, right? I can't tell you how many uh, people, and I'm sure, you know, Frank, uh, down here in South Florida, Frank has run into it too, where people have said, hey, when are we sending in the Marines? When are the U.S. Marines going in, you know, to liberate uh, Venezuela? And there's a lot of Venezuelans in Venezuela that feel uh, the same way. And so once you now start to move, uh, uh, you know, these assets offshore, you're setting an expectation that maybe the Americans will do it for you. And so maybe you don't have to jump out there on the ledge uh, and, and affect change. Um, and so I, I want to be very careful about that. And I think U.S. policy should be very careful about that, too. You know, there are a lot of uh, expectations, not, not just South Florida, uh, you know, electorate or, you know, Venezuelan, um, you know, diasporas and uh, Cuban diasporas in South Florida with expectations on the president, but also, um, you know, Venezuelans with expectations and, and the regime. And so well, we've, we've done a poor job at managing those expectations. And I, I think we have to get that right, uh, too. So Frank, I, final yeah. words. You know, I, I share very much what Cindy said about how the focus of our attention need to be the, the, the Venezuelan people. Uh, people are going to be very distracted 
with coronavirus are very focused inwardly now um, with their own domestic challenges as it relates to this public health crisis and certainly one can understand that. But this is an opportunity to focus on the Venezuelan people. I know some people who disagree with me will say, well, the best way to take care of the Venezuelan people is to get rid of the Venezuelan dictatorship. I understand that, but um, that's not gonna happen overnight. But what is happening overnight is the crisis, the public health crisis, humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. And I think it offers an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to re-engage the region and Venezuela in a diplomatic effort that can find sort of additional uh, benefits uh, that, that go beyond just to simply addressing the humanitarian crisis. We need to bring that component back into the, into the realm and to get our partners in the region, particularly the Lima Group, to participate in that process. We need to do that right away. Thank you. Fascinating conversation. Um, my, my thanks to my FIU colleagues, Frank Moore and Brian Fonseca, and special thanks to Cindy Arnson with the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. for joining us on this Dorothea Green lecture series, Crisis in Venezuela, political to the pandemic. If you have questions or comments, please send them to SIPA at FIU.edu. That's SIPA at FIU.edu. I'm David Kramer with the Green School at FIU. Thanks for joining us. Hey, sounds good. David, can you do that outro again, please? Do the what? Do the outro, like just say uh, thank Frank and thank the panel and then okay, um, just sure. kind of like. I have to thank Frank and Brian again. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe a few times more. I, I think we're going to need to get it rolling. Wow. Um, all right. Ready? One, two, three. Frank, thanks very much for that. And let me thank you and Brian Fonseca, my colleagues here in the Green School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University. And a special thanks to Cindy Arnson at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. for joining us. You've been listening to a Dorothea Green lecture series, Crisis in Venezuela from the geopolitical to the pandemic. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to SIPA at FIU.edu. That's F S I P A at FIU.edu. I'm David Kramer with the Green School of International and Public Affairs at FIU. Thanks for joining us.